Society Smart and Living Showcase is being held in the central feature with all the latest innovations for saving money and energy for each room in your home. At the Ideal Home Exhibition in London, people come and go, dreaming about new labour-saving devices, new possibilities, new designs for living. It's a fantastic product. OK, and then you lean on it and you get your French fries. Not everything here is a design classic, but everything here has been designed to meet a need, fulfil a desire, or simply to raise a cheer at the breakfast table. People who worry about this kind of stuff are called designers. They worry about stuff, not in general, but in particular. The fine detail of stuff. The stuff we build our lives from. They worry about it so that we don't have to. Our mission, our reason to, to be doing what we're doing is to uh, make a make a better world for the small things. OK, they're not scientists, they're not engineers, they're certainly not writers, but they're doing work which is extremely critical to the function of our society. I mean, if design has got anything to offer us, it ought to be that our relationship to objects becomes more thoughtful, wiser, deeper, better considered. You can be a plumber, you can be a journalist, you can be a designer. It's exactly the same thing. One clear way for me to deserve to exist is to serve. You don't think about your toothbrush being designed until you put a badly designed toothbrush in your mouth. So where does design come from? What does it mean to be a designer? What is the special nature, the genius of this thing that we call design? This series sets out to answer those questions. And along the way, we'll tell the story of the world that the designers have made for us. hostile place for us human beings. But frail and fragile as we are, we've managed to survive it, and even thrive in it, thanks to our innate skills as designers. Starting from the simplest stone axe, we've developed tools of increasing sophistication that offer a handle on the most unpromising environment. In fact, our design skills have reached such heights that these days we even manufacture facsimiles of environments which were once all too real and threatening. As for the modern city, the sheer density of design here reaches an almost organic level of complexity. The modern city is a new kind of nature, man-made nature. It reflects back an image of ourselves through the things we have designed. I think that's an interesting thing. 
This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. But for the designer, the world is not enough. Plans for a new improved version are always on the drawing board. I think designers um, always imagine that something could be better, that uh, whatever it is now, uh, rethinking, um, taking advantage of new technologies of production, all of that, I think, drives them on to the idea that they're making a better mousetrap. This is a standard measuring cup, but the key thing is, is that it's made to be um, so that you can read it from above and it's resting on the tabletop and it's stable. So how many of us, when you put stuff in a liquid in a measuring cup, you have to then hold it up? And if it's a liquid, then it gets disturbed and you can't quite tell. And it's this kind of thing, by the way, that I love about design because some of the problems of the world are so difficult to solve. Problems of disease, of poverty, uh, my gosh, uh, how are we going to solve those problems? And so it's inspirational to see somebody actually solve a problem. Uh, it's not a huge problem in the world, but at least it was solved. This is Dieter Rams. In a 50-year career, he can claim to have solved his fair share of problems, with products you may well have switched on or washed up at some time or other. If you didn't notice them, Rams would be pleased. Design, says Rams, should be as discreet as an English butler. But I had in my mind to make the things more quieter. I always had in my mind. Rams is in Tokyo to oversee the opening of an exhibition dedicated to a lifetime's work. And, as ever, to make sure things are just so. You see? This is more correct now. He's also on hand to explain his Ten Commandments, as authoritative and compact as the original. The first, that is good design is innovative. The second will good design makes the product useful. Uh, and of course, the third is good design is aesthetic design. Within the design world, there has long been a controversy of whether a designer is an artist or the designer is an engineer or the designer is a uh, servant of the corporate world. For me, the designer is all of those things. They've got to worry about the economy on the one hand and art on the other. They're the nexus, they're the bridge, they're the crossroads. Good design is honest. Honest. What's a dishonest design? Lying. And ten. <laughs> but good design is as little design as possible. Less That's what I like expressing. But Rams is only one voice in the world of design. There are other gurus following other commandments. Jay Mays is Ford Motor's global head of design. Oklahoma-born and London-based, Mays is ultimately responsible for the look of around 80 million Ford cars on the road today. For me, design is nothing more than a communications tool. It is a way to bend the sheet metal in such a way that it communicates the values of the brand and pulls the customers in, makes them reach in their wallet, pull out the money, and pay for the car. And design is not an analytical process. It's an, it's an emotional process. I always say, if you, if, if you look at the customer, go into the customer's home, as an example, and you will see who they are. 
see that same customer driving around in their car, and that's who they want to be. The problem with people movers generally is that I always think they look as though they smell like diapers. It's essentially a very functional object. So the goal with this vehicle back in um, about 2004 when we started designing it was to introduce a new design language into the Ford of Europe products and we call that design language kinetic design. Now kinetic design is a design language that should visually communicate the idea of the vehicle really moving even when it's standing still. A lot of people ask me if kinetic design has a function. Uh, yeah, the function of kinetic design is to put a smile on your face. However you define it, whether you're from the Church of Rams or the School of Mays, we are now in the position of being able to take good design, more or less, for granted. Well-designed, well-made and affordable products have become the givens of advanced capitalism, along with democracy, wireless internet access and skinny lattes. But good design is the product of a complex, rich history in which the definition of design and the role and status of the designer have changed as the tectonic plates of economics, politics and society have shifted. Capitalism, industrialization, mass production, miniaturization, new materials, new technologies, consumerism, globalization, environmentalism, war and peace, fads and fashion. The design world has mirrored every move we have made. In fact, the story of design offers an alternative history of the modern world, told through stuff. And the players in this version of history aren't politicians or revolutionaries, artists or philosophers. They're the cups and chairs, appliances and vehicles, the tools, gadgets and gizmos of everyday life. But before all that, there was this. In the story of design, this is the Garden of Eden. Before industrialization and mass production divided the designing of things from the making of things. Before the Industrial Revolution, this is how stuff got made. By craftsmen and women operating out of small workshops, turning out a limited range of products in small runs. Each piece could be made broadly to the same design, but each was a little bit different from its siblings, the result of its own moment of creation, the latest expression of the workshop's collective skill. Though you may be producing dozens of pieces, there's still an individuality to the pieces, so uh, they don't need to be exactly the same, but as long as each one has a bit of life, has a flavour, I suppose, that's the important thing, that each piece speaks. Part of what the client, the customer, is looking for is that essential part of the maker, and that's that's what the, the buying really is, mm. not just the object, it's everything that's gone into the making of that piece. Glass can be a little surprising at times, so you think it's going to do one thing and it does something slightly differently and people can't really tell you what it is to do, you've got to feel it and you've got to be able to do it. So you make an awful lot of mistakes before you get it right. I think one of the differences between the handmade pot and the industrial pot is about truth to materials. The clay has a life of its own, and so you have to be in sympathy with it. As you get more practice at doing different designs, then you get neater at them and neater at them. So the first ones we did were quite scruffy, and then they got a bit better. But then they went a bit too neat, so then we had to go back again and just try and <laughs> make them look a little bit more A design will evolve, both from the concept yeah. through the uh, investigation and development work, but also once we start to make a design, once we've decided on a combination of formula, the pieces will evolve. 
That one's, I think, the most pleasing so far, is that compared to the first of the series, uh, this one is, is much more generous. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a different pot. Um, it's designed to be far, far more open and generous than the first one. But I'm pleased, it's got some life, it's got a bit of a spring to it. It's got a couple of air bubbles in it, but hey ho. For industrial designers, the hand and eye of the craftsman is both an inspiration and a standard to aspire to. My grandfather, he was a specialist for surface, for pianos. And I learned from him to polish by hand. And his thumb was like his tool, like a tool, yeah. much thicker as mine. He was thinking not in mass products. And that is what we have to think today too. We have to change mass products into quality products. But controlling a multifaceted manufacturing process is more challenging than throwing a pot on a wheel. Designing for industry is based on a bold premise, that the craftsman's skills can be replicated by a mechanical system in which machines act like humans and humans like machines. What happens in a, in a mass production system is that the craftsmanship is actually transferred from the people who are physically assembling the product back up the chain away from the mass of workers who are actually doing the assembly. And the labor historians actually have a word for it. They call it de-skilling. It says we're going to take the skill away from the majority of people and we're going to invest it in, in a smaller group of people who are either designing the systems or making the machinery that the mass of the people are using. Design was one of the more intriguing byproducts of the Industrial Revolution, along with consumerism, capitalism, global warming, and two and a half centuries of social upheaval. Design's godfathers were the 18th century entrepreneurs, eager to find new ways of making more for less. The Staffordshire potter, Josiah Wedgwood, led the way, exploiting new machine age production methods some of which are still in use at the Wedgwood factory today. But keeping the customer satisfied also meant seizing on the latest management thinking about ways to organize, train, and exploit workers. Central to the new thinking was the idea of the division of labor. The Portland vase, one of Wedgwood's most celebrated technical achievements, is still made today using the same system. I'm a prestige figure maker. Figure maker. So, yeah. 27 years, yeah. Straight from school at 15. I've filled the, the plaster mold with clay and now I'm just going to scrape the excess clay off so that you end up with just the figure in the mold. When I finally get the figure out, it goes to the ornamenter to be ornamented. So someone else puts the figure on the bar? Yeah, the ornamenter. The trickiest part is when I'm actually getting the figure out, some people call the tool that I actually use a spatula. But all the girls who have ever done this job, this is a waddly. A waddly? A waddly, because we waddle like a duck. There's 18 figures on the Portland vase, and these are the same figures, I think, that from when Josiah started. You're on first name terms with Josiah, right? Of course. I've earned it 27 years. One of the other specialisations created by the Division of Labour was the individual who would one day become known as the designer, but who in Wedgwood's day usually went under the label artist. But whatever they were called, in the new era of industrial production, they were the ones responsible for creating the original designs from which all subsequent copies would be made. 
Today, at the Port Mirian Pottery in Stoke-on-Trent, the chief designer is Julian Teed. He learned much of his craft from the late Susan William Ellis, Port Mirian's owner, designer, and enduring inspiration. She would spend hours and hours uh, drawing. She would go to bed with a sketchbook. This is an example of a sketchbook. She was a, a prolific sketcher. She would sit up all night drawing. No need for computers with uh, Susan, I can mm -hmm. tell you. And then I'd come into work the next day and she'd say, Julian, come and have breakfast with me. And we'd go through and sit out in the garden, especially in the summer. Fantastic. I mean, it was such an experience for me. Um, and she'd show me all these drawings that she'd done at like three o'clock in the morning. Uh. Julian is working with modeler Mark Castry to create a commemorative mug based on one of Susan's original designs from the 1960s. The modeler makes a master pattern in plaster, which will in turn be used to make the production molds from which the mugs themselves will be made. Every industrially manufactured product, from a paperclip to an Airbus, has to go through this tooling up process, an act of faith on the part of the manufacturers. There's a lot of upfront cost with industrial design. The product designers are carrying, in effect, this load with them of a, of a corporation that's going to make the stuff, of factories that are going to produce it, of people who are going to finance it, of marketers who have a strategy to produce it. And unless the designer is attuned to all of those things, it won't happen. So it's not a casual activity. And I think designers, good designers, know all that uh, and strive to kind of hit the sweet spot that will satisfy all these diverse elements. For the industrial product, this is the moment of creation, the chance to get everything right before the production line starts to roll. What we have here is Mark modeling directly back into the plaster. As you can see, it's a very skilled, detailed and fine job. And what he's putting into this mug now is his soul. It's going in there right now. You're watching it as he's scratching it in. And it'll stay there forever. So when you go into the shop and you, you buy a mug for 12 pounds, that has got a part of Susan, a part of Mark, a part of me. It, you know, that's the passion of pottery. And pottery is about passion. There's no doubt about it. You know, we're making pots out of mud. That's what we're doing at the end of the day. We're digging mud out of the ground and we're putting it through flames. And to do that with real passion, you need people. You can't do it just with machines. Mass production, complicated ideas about beauty. Show the average romantic poet a Grecian urn, or even one of the imitation urns turned out by the Wedgwood factory, and he would tell you that beauty is truth. Truth, beauty. But what about the beauty of a bridge made of iron? The iron bridge in Colebrookdale is an early testament to the beauty of the machine made and the truth of the mass produced. The modern age of industrialization was allowed to speak through the Iron Bridge with its own distinctive voice. The Iron Bridge had its origins with another 18th century entrepreneur, Abraham Darby. Unlike Wedgwood, he worked with molten iron rather than pliable clay. In the early 18th century, he invented a new way of casting iron, using multiple molds made out of sticky green sand. The simple brilliance of Darby's method was that once the iron cooled, the molds could be broken, the product removed, and the sand remolded from a master pattern. This is all really sort of advanced sandcastle building, but for an industry. And the point being that once you've invested in your pattern, you can use that again and again and again and again to make your moulds. It doesn't matter then that the moulds get destroyed because you can reuse the sand. It's only sand. But the value is in the pattern. 
The top seller from Darby's Colebrookdale Ironworks was this. Quaker plain, functional and durable. The Darby cooking pot came in a variety of sizes and any color you wanted, so long as it was black. The significance of all this is that um, this is really the sort of one of the first mass-produced industrial objects. I mean, there's a lovely bit in Darby's patent which says that this he's got a better method of casting pots, and this will be of great benefit to the poor of the kingdom. In other words, there's a lot of the poor of the kingdom, and I can sell a lot of them. You could say Darby was the designer. I mean, it's a classic one where coming up with the process, the manufacturing process, has had a powerful influence on the design, and it's just a beautifully simple thing. And the only real bit of decoration on it are those two lines there, and the fact that they haven't gone straight up with this, it's got a lovely curve on it, and that's about it, and it's so simple. But the appreciation of the aesthetics of mass production did not come naturally particularly in the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. In Victorian Britain, as the machine age advanced, public tastes retreated. The transformation of the country by industrial capitalism would take place behind a Gothic facade, barnacled with knights, damsels and heraldic beasts. For William Morris, the most celebrated and influential designer of the 19th century, machines were at best a threat, at worst a menace. He wasn't against machines per se, because he could see that machines could, if they were properly regulated, they could make life better for people. But he couldn't bear the thought of this beauty being achieved at the expense of the people who were producing in these inhumane conditions, and that a beautiful object really must be made in beautiful surroundings by people who were living reasonable lives, lives with some pleasure in them, not the kind of lives that a lot of people in Victorian England were being forced to live and work in. Morris's response to the unacceptable face of industrialization was to plan a route back to the Garden of Eden by relearning craft skills that the machine was replacing. Morris had an almost instinctive need to learn how do you print a textile, how do you dye and cloth the color that you absolutely wanted, how do you weave a tapestry. And he set himself the task really of learning, of mastering all these um, processes, believing that that was an important part of a designer's role in a way. And this, of course, is why Morris is so important in relation to the arts and crafts movement. He's important as a designer, as a reforming designer, but at the same time, he is this towering craftsman, and he's an inspiration to the next generation who equally see you know, a different way of designing and making objects in a smaller workshop environment. In the National Archives in Kew, it's possible to see today what Morris was taking on when he pitted his handcrafted designs against the best that the machine age could offer. The design registers were set up in 1839 to allow manufacturers to seek copyright protection for their designs. That's extraordinary. The volumes covering ceramics or metalwork contain sketches or photographs, but the textile registers contain actual samples cut from the original bolts of cloth. Hidden away from the light of day, these are the X-Files of Victorian taste. This is what was in the market. This is everything that came. This is what people sent in. This is what people were registering. So uh, it's very representative. And what strikes me is it just gives you immediately, just for the sheer weight and volume, gives you an idea of British output at the time, manufacturing. Somewhere buried in this volume, which covers just a few months of the year 1883, 
Our Designs by Morris and Company. I think William Morris was the greatest pattern designer, the, probably, that the world's ever seen, and his patterns are really instantly recognisable. Morris was a genius at simplification, and he took patterns from nature, and he made them into these wonderful, imaginative, quite formalised but very simple patterns, very unlike anything that was around at that particular period in Victorian design. Ah, now look, here we are on something quite different level. We have, interestingly here, on this Morris and Company um, textile, in fact, we even have uh, on the selvage, uh, you can see Morris and Company just beginning, and then just the end, the tail end, as it were, of Oxford Street here. And there's a couple of things that jump, jump out at me. One is the pattern. It's organized in such a very tight, controlled, and sophisticated way that you're immediately drawn to it as something different. It's quite different from, if I can, if I may, just turn the page over, um, from the exoticism that we generally see in which certain basic forms are taken and then sort of repeated ad infinitum. And the other thing that's different is the colour, because we've seen some very bright colours and some pretty obvious colours, um, chemical dyes and so on, used in their manufacture. But here, it's clear that it's something a little more natural. So here he is amongst all the huge manufactories of, of the Midlands and so on, competing and showing his own, and extraordinarily, he's come up with something quite different and offering it to the market. But though Morris could hold his own on quality, when it came to price, his handmade, labor-intensive products put him at a disadvantage to the machine-made competition. Morris did try to make things in an economical way, but he was always up against the problem of wanting the tremendous quality. And how do you solve the problem? It's the problem that's been besetting design ever since. He never really solved the problem, and he got into terrible torments and rages about it, and said, I'm spending my life ministering to the swinish luxury of the rich. Design is a servant to capitalism. I think that's something that I accepted many years ago. But design can never be a pure activity because it's always connected with how things are bought, how things are sold, how things are used, how things are thrown away or recycled. All of these different aspects of how consumption operates need to be acknowledged, understood, and sometimes manipulated so that you can create beautiful, resolute, astounding pieces of work. By the closing decades of the 19th century, the techniques of industrial manufacturing had become widely established, particularly in America, where everything from sewing machines to bicycles were being produced to the same formula, standardized parts made by special tools assembled by semi or unskilled workers to a uniform design. It became known as the American system, and Josiah Wedgwood would surely have approved. But mass production, in the full modern sense of the phrase, had yet to be realized. Industrialization's promise and capitalism's dream was of identical products by the million, whose unit cost fell magically as volumes increased. Mass production meant the relentless production of the same thing in sufficient numbers, not only to make it universally available, but to make it universally affordable as well. This dream and this promise 
would find their first and their ultimate expression in a product that has transformed our lives and our world for good and ill. There are three great significant 20th century art forms, I think. The one is the movies. Uh, the other second one is rock music. The third is industrial design, of which the automobile is the, uh, is the paradigm. I can't think of anything better than seeing a car that I've worked on drive down the street, and I always look to see who's in it, and I always look to see if it's the person that I imagined that should be driving that car. And it doesn't matter if it's the smallest or, or the most expensive car, it doesn't matter if it's a sports car or an SUV, it doesn't matter if it's a V8 or an electric car, there's a car out there for everyone. The idea of a car for everyone came early on. But the first time around, it was the same car for everyone. And like Abraham Darby's cooking pot two centuries earlier, it was any color you wanted, so long as it was black. Henry Ford didn't invent the automobile, but he invented a way to get it to the most possible people at a great affordable price. Henry Ford said he, he never spoke to his customers. He said, because if his customers, um, if he asked his customers what they wanted, they'd just say faster horses. Uh, and he had a better idea on how to make, make a faster horse. The Model T was essentially a wagon that had the horses in, in, in the form of an engine under the seat and it completely transforms the way people think about moving from point A to point B. And that was probably the biggest thing that Henry Ford brought to society, was the idea of freedom. The story of the Model T begins here, on Piquette Avenue in Detroit. Who designed the Model T? The clear vision for the Model T, about what it ought to be, was Henry Ford's and he wanted a car that was light and simple and inexpensive to manufacture, inexpensive to operate. But in detail, he worked with a number of people who um, literally sat down in a room, and locked the door, and they went inside, and they worked the design out together. I didn't think there was anybody working on the Model T Ford who called himself a designer. You know, when technologies are new, they don't need to be designed. The technology in itself was so utterly, utterly intoxicatingly wonderful. When Henry Ford looked at a Model T, he, in, in essence, saw through the body, and he saw this chassis, and he knew all the ingenuity that had been designed into it, and he appreciated it. To him, it was beautiful. The body design was a bit of an afterthought. Um, it was necessary, obviously, you had to have a body and you had to have seats and, and all, but um, it, was, it was never very high on Henry Ford's list. A hundred years on from the birth of the Model T, and car design remains a game of two halves, the body and the chassis. Not only are they made separately, they are also conceived separately, the product of two different mindsets, design and engineering, Wedgwood and Darby, Venus and Mars. It is a given that we want to be best in class in terms of fuel efficiency, in terms of quality, in terms of safety. My role is very different. I'm sort of the adolescent in the room. I'm the guy that says, how are we going to create a thrilling product for the customer so that once all of those functional requirements have been met, we've actually wrapped that all in this unbelievably attractive package that wants to bring that customer into our showroom. For designers, the chassis is the platform, which exists to support their designs. For engineers, design is styling, sometimes pronounced packaging.
The moment on the production line when chassis and body meet is called the marriage. And like many marriages, the outward show of unity often masks tensions that led up to the wedding day. It used to be, maybe in the 60s and 70s, that engineers fancied themselves as the guys that built the cars, and the designers would come in and make them kind of look nice at the end. So our job was really to come in and make the engineering less ugly. I suppose if you, if you really dig down in organizations, there's always an engineer that thinks that their piece of the automobile is the most important. Uh, as long as they understand at the end of the day that that's wrong, then I'm happy. But the Model T is about more than the design of an individual car. Ford's towering achievement was to design a means of production that would literally change the world. They found that they could sell all they could make. Henry Ford's goal, however, was to make all he could sell. And so they essentially, basically sort of froze the design of the car. And then they went after the production process. Ford set out to do for cars what Wedgwood had done with teapots and tureens. But he went further than any industrialist had ever gone before. They said, instead of having one guy at a bench make a whole transmission, what if we have several guys at a bench and each one does a little thing on the transmission and then shoves it down the bench to the next guy? And then they said, well, that worked better. Let's try the engine. Let's try the rear axle. Let's try the front axle. They were groping their way towards the assembly line. And eventually, it became logical to say, what about assembling the whole car? So that by the end of 1913, they actually had three full-blown assembly lines, parallel lines, cranking out Model T. When the first ones were built, which were built Conventionally, it took 12 and a half man-hours to make a single car. By the time mass production was fully implemented, it took 93 minutes to make a single car. In today's sort of fragmented car market, where you've got all these different choices, it's hard for us to understand that at its peak, virtually half of the automobiles in the world were Model T Fords. But there was a fatal flaw with the Ford system. It had become too good at what it was designed to do. They weren't making cars in any general way. They were making this very specific product. And machines that they designed were so specialized that they were only good for making parts for Model Ts. And Ford became less an automobile company than a Model T company. General Motors and Chrysler realized in the 1920s that that's what you needed to do. You needed to restyle and you needed to make significant changes to the appearance of vehicles and occasionally to the functional elements of vehicles in order to make them continuously attractive. Otherwise, obviously, the, the end game would be that everybody would own a car and nobody would need to replace it. You know, you have to make an object not only desirable to buy, but desirable to replace as well. But what happens in a consumer society, as soon as you establish that baseline, somebody says, can I have a little more? Can I have a little more comfort? a little more speed, a little more style, colors maybe. Suddenly, at that point is when design was born because we had answered the functional attributes of moving the customer from point A to point B, and now we were offering the customer a choice of how to go from point A to point B. And then you could make the car more attractive through colors, through different materials, and then eventually through different shapes, and that started to create the design industry as we know it. Falling sales of the Model T forced Ford to halt production in 1927 and to set about designing this year's model, the Model A. But Ford's reluctance to return to the drawing board cost his company millions of dollars in lost production and its place as the dominant player in the car market. He had learned the hard way a fundamental truth about the consumer society that was coming into being. 
We, the people, are not content with iron pots. We want Wedgwood vases too. My sense is that he thought that this was not only all the car you would ever need, it's all the car you should ever want. And so ironically, the guy who set this whole 20th century consumer culture did so much to set it in motion, found himself increasingly alienated from it. And hanging on to the Model T was sort of his way of saying, slow down. <laughs> but it was fruitless. He couldn't slow it down. Today, we live in a post-Ford world, a world in which potters design on computers and print out their pots in 3D. A world in which mass production has been replaced by mass customization, and the buzz phrase is the market of one. A world in which our appetite for stuff has become a problem we'd rather not think about too much. But however our stuff is designed and made and disposed of, it remains a designed world, made by us and for us, overseen by designers who will continue to worry about the way things are and how to make them just a little bit better. I don't want to make a new chair because I believe that there are enough chairs there. But, uh, what is always interesting is to find a solution uh, which has some new things on it. For example, you need a solution for soft floors, hard floors, and wheels, you know. Three important things. But no chair has all these three, I know. Okay, let me think about that. Right now I'm still thinking. <laughs> yes.